Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is Unit 1, Lesson 4, on the five themes of geography. How do we view the world around us? And how does the world view us? In this lesson, we're going to learn more about the five elements of geographical study that help us define and describe locations in the world. Obviously, you've heard the saying before, location, location, location. The importance of knowing where we're talking about and the features that come along with it, both physical and cultural, are really important. And in a class like World Cultures, I'm sure you can imagine the importance of understanding the different themes of geography and how we can actually use them in our everyday lives. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we do, please let me advise you to please open up the assignment for today and complete the content fill-in or key concept questions that coincide with this presentation. Also, please make sure that you finish the five themes of geography challenge and the geographical part of the lesson as well. You'll see that on the second and third part of the Google Doc. So let's begin. What is geography? Geography is the study of the Earth's surface. It includes people's responses to topography and climate and soil and vegetation. We think of geography often as being places in the world, like maybe landforms, mountains, rivers, so on and so forth. But really, when you think about it, geography is pretty much what the Earth looks like and how people interact with the environment, too. There's many different elements of geography, and that's what this course is all about. We're going to be taking a deeper, closer look at all of those elements in full. So what are the five themes of geography that I mentioned? The five themes of geography are categories that scientists use to study the Earth's features. They are movement, region, human environmental interaction, and location and place. Together, these five themes help us define and describe in the best way possible unique characteristics under these domains to help people get a better sense of where in the world we're talking about and what we're talking about. Let's go ahead and take a look at movement first. The study of movement basically revolves around humans interacting with each other as well as many places and things almost every single day. We travel from place to place and we communicate with each other in many different ways too. That's also movement and we depend on products, information, and ideas that come from outside our environments. These pictures over here might help you get a better visual construct about what movement consists of. Anytime you take the bus to school, that's movement. Anytime you send a text, believe it or not, that's movement as well, because the transfer of technology and information is part of that category. So movement explores where different resources are located, the people that use them, and how they are transported to locations all over the Earth's surface. The theme of movement helps us understand how we connect with and depend on other regions, cultures, and people in the world. Movement continued. Think about this. How are people, goods, information, and ideas move from place to place? Well, when you look at people and goods, obviously trucks, cars, planes, trains, buses, and boats might help people and goods move from point A to point B. Like I said before, with information, telephones, computers, with email and internet, and mail also help information move pretty fluidly. And when it comes to basic ideas, how trends and fads move from place to place, magazines and books and radio and TV and the media help that type of communicational movement take place as well. Now let's talk about regions. Scientists divide the Earth's land into sections called regions based on certain traits that those sections share. Regions may be created based on the following characteristics, the same climate, like weather trends, location, where it is on a map, languages and cultures of a people, and landforms like mountains or plains, wetlands or desert. Let's look at some examples. So North and South America are based on the location of the map. When we say North and South America, people can generally use their geographical understandings to understand where we're talking about. Latin America, for example, is an iconic region it's primary Spanish-speaking countries, right? And they're located between North and South America. When we use regions to describe where we're talking about, we're actually pinpointing broad areas. Yes, this is true, but also areas that have unique and specific characteristics exclusively to them. Let's look at the United States. You might have heard of these regional terms before, the Northeast, the Southeast, the Midwest, the Southwest, the Rocky Mountain region, and the Pacific region those same types of geographical constructs can apply to many places in the world. When I say Asia, you might just be thinking about China or Russia. But when I say Southeast Asia, you might be thinking of places like Thailand or Vietnam or Laos and Cambodia. 
Now let's move on to human environmental interaction. This is the study of how people interact with their surroundings. Pe people depend on their environment. This is true. For example, we depend on the land or the soil to grow food. We depend on rivers and streams for drinking water and or transporting goods. And so when we think about our interactions with the environment, ever since the dawn of mankind, we've been interacting with it. However, do you ever stop and think that environment has always been interacting with us in ways more than what we ever could imagine? Let's continue our study of this. <coughs> in regards to human environmental interaction, people can and do modify and change their environment. When we pave roads to travel on, we're changing it. When we clear the land to build houses and buildings on, we're also changing the environment. But people also adapt to their environment too. We wear lighter clothing in the summer when it's warm and hot and wear heavier clothing in the winter or cold to adjust accordingly. When it comes to human environmental interaction, we're also focusing on the consequences as well as the benefits to actions we take on interacting with our environment. Here are some positive things. The more interaction between people of different cultures can obviously have many different positives for human environment interaction. Some negative ones are pretty obvious. The faster use of the Earth's natural resources obviously isn't good, air pollution is horrible, and global warming is a geographical phenomenon that is having ramifications already as we speak. So when we think about human environmental interaction, think about some of the positive and negative consequences not mentioned here um, when we move forward in this class. Next is location. The theme of location answers the question, <laughs> well, where is it? It describes where place is on Earth. There are two kinds of location. There's absolute location, which is the exact location of a place on Earth. And then there's relative location. Relative location is the location of a place when compared to other places. For example, if I were to ask you, where is your school? Many of you might use general terms like relative location to describe it. Well, our school is located here between the points of here and around the corner of here. It's around this place as well that you might be familiar with, right? Many people might use those terms. There are benefits to using absolute location too. For example, when you're not sure about a place that you're traveling to, often you might open up Google Apps on your phone or some type of other device, a GPS device perhaps, to get from point A to point B. Using lines of latitude and longitude can be helpful to find an exact, specific location. <coughs> Next. In regards to absolute location, of course we're talking about the exact location on a place on Earth. Some examples, of course, consist of using degrees of latitude and longitude, like I mentioned, on the globe. If you've ever seen those lines before and you ever wondered what the heck they are, that's your answer. <laughs> and when we also think about addresses of specific houses or buildings, that's where those um, absolute location terms come to mind. You can see here that defining the latitude and longitude of Michigan is as follows. Now these numbers might look long and confusing to you, but we're going to get in the habit of using latitude and longitude in the best way possible together as a class to be able to actually look at maps and understand what those lines mean and how they benefit us. Well, we also look at location from a relative construct. Like I said before, the location of a place in relation to other places can be helpful. It's usually described sometimes with directions like north, south, east, west, and landmarks that are nearby, and distance to or from other places. So for example, let's go back to that um, instance. Our school is west of Telegraph Road and four blocks from the fire station, or my house is on Ann Arbor Trail across the street from the gas station. Those things can really help people get a general sense of where you're talking about. And some people, their minds work better in relative location anyway. Now let's move on to place. The theme that place answers the question, what is it like there? A place is often known by its own special characteristics. So characteristics are special traits or qualities that a place can have. Types of characteristics for place could be human or physical. Let me explain. When it comes to place, the human characteristics could be as follows, like the main customs or languages and beliefs of people in a certain place, special traditions or holidays, clothing styles, political ideals, architecture, like how buildings are made. Those items could all be exclusive to a particular place that we're talking about in the world. When we think about physical characteristics, however, when it comes to place, we're referring to mountains or plains or oceans or rivers or lakes or climate, whether it be hot, cold, humid, or dry, types of animals that live there, and what types of plants that actually grow there. I think a pretty good example of that might be something like if we were to say, what is the place of your school and your community? 
you might say, well, we are exclusive to the Lehigh Valley. However, we are also rather close to New Jersey. And if you want to get really technical, you could talk about some of the cultural attributes that we have in our community. We could talk about the fact that there's the borough, there's the township. Um, there's also special festivals that are exclusive to Easton and Wilson, like the Bacon Festival, <laughs> which I didn't even know was a thing until I you know, moved here in the nearby area. So all those characteristics can define and describe place. So in conclusion, why did we have to talk about the five themes of geography? Can't we just say, okay, well, this place is here and I'm coming from here and that's it? Not quite. Scientists and students use the five themes of geography so that they can understand how the world works and what people can do to make it better for all of us. In this class, using the five themes of geography will help you keep an objective but fair lens on the world from a geographical and cultural construct. Thank you very much for tuning in. Once again, please go ahead and complete the Google Doc assignment that's been designated for you on Google Classroom, and please reach out if you have any questions or need to ask for clarity. Thank you.